Lord willing, this coming Sunday we'll finish the fourth servant song. In my opinion, the pinnacle of all the prophecies of Isaiah. So that's Isaiah 53. We're going to be in 54. Isaiah 54. But we are in an interesting position tonight. I was thinking about this and I was thinking, boy, I really would like to wait to go on to Isaiah 54 until we finished Isaiah 53. You know, I would like to have that under our belt before we move on to what comes next. And then I, and the more I thought about this and, and prayed about it, I thought, you know, we're actually, where we are in the study of the Word is very similar to where we are in life. In that we are in the in-between. We are in between Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 54. This is where we are in the age of the earth. We have, we have seen the sacrifice of the servant. We know the redemptive, justifying work of the cross is finished. It's complete. It's done. Salvation is available to anyone for the asking. But we are also patiently waiting for what we have not yet seen. And Isaiah 54 starts to talk about what we have not seen. Isaiah 55 is is a little different. You'll see that in a few minutes. But Isaiah 54, we haven't seen this actually happen yet. The consummation of the servant's sacrifice. What it all ultimately means, especially for the people of Israel, we haven't seen that yet. So we're in between. 53 and 54. So I figure since we're in between 53 and 54 in life, it's with faith that we look ahead. We look back at Isaiah 53. Right now we're going to look ahead to Isaiah 54, something that has not yet happened. And we patiently wait for it. Isaiah 54 is, I believe, what Paul was talking about in his somewhat effusive introduction to the Ephesians. When he says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now I read that to you in the King James because I really like how, how it translates in the dispensation of the fullness of times. I think the NASB says something about with an administration to a view of the fullness of times. And you read that and you go, what? (laughs) I'm not sure what that means. The dispensation of the fullness of times. That means the age when everything has been fulfilled. So Paul says that he has made this known to us. He's let us know what this age is going to look like. What it's about. And that in that age, he's going to gather all things together in Christ Jesus. We're not there yet. We're in the in-between. But tonight we skip ahead from the suffering servant to the song of the servants, plural. And beyond that, to the salvation of even more servants, plural. And we begin with this great truth. I'm going to give you five things kind of as an outline as we walk through this tonight. Number one is Zion's song will be fulfilled. Zion's song will be fulfilled. Verse 1 of chapter 54. Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Zion's song will be fulfilled. Verses 1, 2, and 3 of Isaiah 54 has been called the song of Zion. Because it is a shout of praise. It is a song of praise. In fact, that opening line there, shout for joy. The word shout for joy, a single word in the Hebrew is renan. And renan means sing, rejoice. Just let loose with joyful singing. The Greek equivalent would be kairo. Kairo, which is used by Paul when he says in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You don't have to ask Paul, really, how often are we supposed to rejoice in the Lord? Can you give us some idea? You know, is it a little every day? Is it every other week? Is it on Sundays only? When is it? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. There is no time in our lives when we can't rejoice in the Lord. And I saw it last night standing by the bed of Deb Seibel in the hospital, who had back surgery yesterday, came out of the surgery. She was on morphine, so yesterday was a good day. 
today not as much. Today they tried to get her up, and and her daughter told me it was very, very painful and very difficult, and she was back in bed, and perhaps tomorrow. But Cheryl and I dropped by there about eight o'clock last night, and just we're talking to Deb, and if you know Deb, you know she just never is caught without a smile. I mean, she's there with the hospital blankets and the gown and the and and she's just so happy, you know. And at first I thought it was the morphine talking, but the more she talked, the more I realized, no, she always sounds like this. Just joyful, just rejoicing. Straight out of back surgery. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. Gang, we above all people on the face of the earth have a reason to rejoice, and His name is Jesus. We can always rejoice in Him. But this is Zion's song, not ours. <laughs> Israel is the one here invited to sing as God again confirms His impossible, unconditional covenant promise to Abraham Now, what is that covenant? We talked about it last week. Genesis 15, verse 5. God took Abraham outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said said to him, So shall your descendants be. This is why, as we talked about last week, God told Israel, Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. When he was but one, I called him and then I blessed him and multiplied him. Isaiah 51, verses 1 and 2. And remember we talked about that. Look back to Abraham. Why? Because birth was impossible. Because multiplication could not happen by any natural standards. Sarah was in her 90s. Abraham over 100 when Isaac was born. Sarah had been barren her entire life. Based on medical science, Israel is an impossibility. Should never have existed. And yet, God said, look at the stars, Abram. See how many there are? Go ahead, start counting them. That's how many descendants you will have. And here in Isaiah 54, this covenant truth is expanded. Listen to this. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. What does that mean? It means, gang, that the remnant of Israel ultimately is going to be greater in number than Israel was at the height of Solomon's kingdom. The number in the coming kingdom will be far greater than that. God is going to do a remarkable thing. How ironic that yesterday in a German court in Cologne, circumcision was declared to be a crime. It is now illegal. Now it's being fought, but as uh, as of yesterday, it is illegal for a Jewish parent to circumcise their child. Which some people might say, well, you know, big deal. Well, it is a big deal because that is the sign of the covenant. Why circumcision? You ever wonder that? You men? (laughs) Why did he do it? Well, because the covenant was with Abraham's seed. He says, I want you to circumcise yourself and your son because it is through your seed that all the world's going to be blessed. I'm going to bless your seed, Abraham. Now, he was a little slow to understand that. He thought, well, okay, if it's my seed, but it's not necessarily Sarah's egg, so Hagar will work. And that was a bad choice. God said, no, 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 no. It's going to be you and your wife that do things the right way, see, God says. Jerusalem Post article talking about this uh, declaration of circumcision being criminal. A regional court in the West German city of Cologne issued a decision terming circumcisions to be a form of bodily harm and subject to criminal penalties. Triggering an angry reaction, no doubt, from the Central Council of Jews on Tuesday, according to the head of the Central Council, Dr. Dieter Graumann, the court issued an unprecedented and dramatic interference in the self-determination right of religious communities. But don't worry, this is Zion's song. This is a song of rejoicing. It's not Zion's dirge, and the land and its people will be overwhelmingly fruitful, and no legal court can stop that. What does the word Zion mean? Close? I mean, it is Jerusalem, yeah. But it's a Hebrew word. Remember this from Sunday. In fact, look back. Isaiah 53, verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of... 
The Retz Zion, parched ground. Zion means parched ground. Zion is that place that, as we talked about, if you were to look at Zion, when David first saw it, rocky, mountainous, desertous. Not much to it. Why would God choose that place out of all the places on earth? Why would he choose a desolate, parched piece of land to say, that's my capital? Because all of the blessing and greatness and glory of Zion would be him, not Zion. He could have chosen Mount Rainier for Zion. And people would say, oh, but it's a glorious, beautiful mountain. No, it's not the mountain that he wants to be called beautiful and glorious. It's him. So he chose the parched ground. Jesus was the root who came up out of the parched land, the dry land, when no one expected it. And so back over here in chapter 54, we we come back to this parched place of Zion. A land that is parched but would become fruitful, overwhelmingly fruitful, especially in that millennial kingdom. It will be unlike anything we've, we've ever seen. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24. Think about that. He's the root that sprung up. Remember Sunday? Sprung up out of parched ground. That root then grew, matured, was cut off, germinated. As he was cut off, he seeds the land. His death provided, as he said, It provided for bearing of much fruit out of the land. And so that's what Zion's song is about. This this land is going to be fruitful. This land is going to see a massive increase of the people of Israel. A great blessing. God is going to not just barely get his blessing in under the wire. He is going to overwhelm the wire. And the people of Israel are going to be blessed. And the kingdom will be remarkable. And so God says in verse 2, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. And the picture here, gang, is a Bedouin tent. And you think about that. If you've been to Israel, you see them. They, they mark a lot of the hillsides, especially of Judea. As you're going up to Jerusalem, you see many different Bedouin tents. And some of them are, are very large. If you were to go inside of them, you would be shocked at how beautiful and ornate they are on the inside, especially as compared to the outside. But God saying this to Israel, this is a picture that would immediately come to mind, a Bedouin tent. And God saying, you need to enlarge it. You're not going to have enough room for what I'm about to do. It's got to be bigger. Spread out. Enlarge. Pull up your tent pegs. Make them bigger. You're going to need these stronger cords. You can almost hear God, you know, kind of pronouncing this over the people as they're trying to put their tents up and they put one up and God says, no, no, bigger. Okay. No, no, that's not going to be big. You need to enlarge that one over there too. And commanding the people, be ready. I am about to do something big here. Verse 3, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. Not only the land of Zion, but the nations are going to be filled. Jewish people running around everywhere. I mean, you think the entertainment's good now. (laughs) You think the scientific knowledge is impressive now? You think about the blessings of the Jewish people on the world today. And it's going to be far beyond in terms of numbers in that millennial kingdom. God is saying, make room, Israel. You're going to need it. He is inspiring the idea of growth. And, you know, we can borrow from that. It's not our promise, but we certainly can hold on to it along with Israel. God is into growth. God has always been into growth. God is not into shrinking things, making things smaller. He wants to, he wants to see churches grow. I completely believe that. Now, I know there are those who say, oh, we don't want to get larger. You know, no, we want to do what God wants us to do. And when God says, go into all the world and make disciples, go into all the nations, well, that's, that's our call, you know. When he tells us to reach the lost who are all around us, well, I... By last count, 24,000 people in Oak Harbor, 15,000 people in Anacortes, and there's probably about 1,500 in Oak Harbor who go to church. 1,500 out of 24,000. Is that right? Yeah, my numbers are right. In Anacortes, 15,000 people and about 1,000 go to church. How are we doing? We're not growing. Like God, at least the field is ripe 
for harvest. God wants us to grow. A young man by the name of William Carey understood that. William Carey, back in 1792, he founded the Baptist Missionary Movement. William Carey was a young cobbler from Piddington, England. And he, who's heard of Piddington before? Sounds like something you put on the front end of like a, a cartoon bear's name. Piddington Bear, you know. I mean, that, Piddington, England. This is where this guy's from. A cobbler from a small town in Nowheresville, William Carey. And he came along and read, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. And God used that verse to call this man into mission work. And he began what eventually would be in the late 1700s throughout the 1800s, the missionary movement in the world. He left his home in England. He went to India, translated the Bible into Sanskrit, had thousands of conversions there in India. And now is known, renowned throughout the world historically as the father of the modern mission movement. When you read about the Philadelphia, the Church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, it describes what William Carey did. That he went out, Church of the Open Door. He went out and he took the gospel and spread the word of God. And all because he came across Isaiah 54 verse 2 and realized the Spirit was commanding, expand, increase. Spread out. This enlarged tent is a great picture of God's intentions. <laughs> which are the germination of the gospel. That the gospel would take root. God wants his church to grow. Colossians 1.6 tells us the gospel which has come to you. Just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understand the grace of God in truth. It's not just a picture for Israel, however. It is a reality. It is Zion's song. Listen to this. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 12. There will be peace for the seed. The vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce. And the heavens will give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all these things. So we read this and we say, great, enlarge the place of our tent. We need to get that building built. Okay? And we're going to give you some information about where we're at. There's a big, massive green machine on there right now. And I'm asking Steve to get me the keys because I just want to drive through the trees and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but it's over there. Our hope and our prayer is to at least have a foundation laid by the, by, by early fall. Get, get the foundation laid and get the, get the metal in there for the, for the steel in there for the building to go up. But gang, it, it's grow time. You know? It's grow time. This is what God has called us to. But though we are called to grow, and we can look at this and be motivated by it to grow, God is saying to Israel, oh, you're going to grow. You're going to be huge. I, I want to take a backdoor approach in thinking about this, because we've talked about the size of Israel before um, and the size that God promised. The kingdom of Israel under Solomon, many of you already know this, was of roughly 30,000 square miles. What is the size of Israel today? Israel today, the modern state of Israel in the Middle East, currently spans 11,200 square miles. It's roughly a third the size it was in the glory days of Solomon. Now that includes the disputed territories of the Gaza Strip, which is 139 square miles, the Golan Heights, which is 444 square miles, and the so-called West Bank, which is truly Judea and Samaria, that's what we should be calling it, because that's what it is, is 2,262 square miles. If you put it all together, 11,200 square miles. But if you look at what is considered Israel proper and take out all those disputed territories that the world is fighting over and saying Israel should give back, the land of Israel would be approximately 8,000 square miles. 8,000 square miles. Let me give you a visual. The state of Vermont is 9,200 square miles. So modern Israel, based on the land that the world is saying you're allowed to have, is smaller than the state of Vermont. That's a postage stamp in the Middle East. But you Bible students know God has promised, guaranteed Israel, a square mileage of 300,000. 
Not 11,000 as today, not 30,000 as with Solomon. 300,000 square miles will mark the boundaries of the modern state of Israel, the millennial state of Israel, the size of the nation when Jesus comes. That's remarkable. So Zion's song will be fulfilled to the very last note. And it will be glorious. Secondly, Israel's shame will be forgotten. Verse 4. Israel's shame will be forgotten. Fear not. For you will not be put to shame. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more, for your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. The God of all the earth, gang, affectionately claims Israel as his wife. And this is the first time in Scripture it is so boldly announced. There are hints of it before this. But this is the first time God comes right out and says, You're my wife, Israel. I claim you as my wife. We will hear it pronounced even more in Jeremiah. Ezekiel will talk about the wife of God. And Hosea will be a graphic picture of the wife of God who goes a whoring. And he still brings her back. But Israel here is called the wife of God. Hosea chapter 2 verse 19 tells us, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in loving kindness and in compassion. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. This intimate relationship. God says, Israel, you're my wife. Don't you understand how I love you? And I'll tell you this, and you husbands get this too. My wife is the person I love more than anybody else on the planet, my children included. Which bothers my children sometimes. I tell them, I love you more than anybody else, but I love your mom just a little bit more. Well, why, Dad? Don't you want me to? Don't you want me to love your mom? Because if I don't love your mom, how do you know I love you? And if God doesn't call Israel as his wife and love her passionately, how can we be sure he loves us, who he calls sons and daughters, who he draws in? Now, Israel is the wife of God, just as the church is the bride of Christ. And it's the way that God relates to Israel versus the way that Jesus relates to the church. Still the same God. But there's a very unique and beautiful way that he relates to us. But staying with this intimate arrangement, God mentions the shame of Israel's youth and the reproach of Israel's widowhood. So the idea here, again, being kind of graphic, that that you will forget the shame of your youth. You will forget that you were not really a virgin anymore. Israel not a virgin? Yeah, because they went after idol worship. And they prostituted themselves with other gods. They left their husband, their maker, for idols. God says, that was shameful. That was shameful. And actually, the shame of their youth began in their bondage in Egypt. You're going to forget all about that. You're going to forget about the shameful running away that you did. You are going to forget about your widowhood. Well, what's that? I'll tell you in just a second. I gotta time this. Sometimes they're not that loud. Other times they're. What is the reproach of the widowhood? The reproach of her widowhood. Her widowhood gang speaks of her worldwide dispersion. When Israel felt like they had lost God. There are some Jews who think themselves widows, by the way. They think God is dead. They assume their maker, their husband, is dead. And therefore, assume themselves to be widows. Read verse 6. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you, he says. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now, remember, this this is true for everybody who is saved by grace. That God has compassion on us, that he brings us in, that he loves us, that he shows us his loving kindness, which is the Hebrew word for grace. 
But remember, God, the holy husband, is talking about his wife, Israel. He's talking to her. A little side note. We have to remain clear that Israel is the wife of God in Isaiah. We have to remain clear that Israel is the wife of God in Jeremiah and Ezekiel as we come to those great prophets. If we, when we get to uh, Hosea, that, he, that Israel is the wife of God. Remember that. It's not the church. And I say that because I read an interesting quote. We've talked about this, but Ironside said the following. Note that these are promises of God's word to Israel. And he says, we Christians are such thieves. We steal so many things that belong to Israel and we try to apply them to ourselves. This tendency was reflected in our old Bagster Bibles. Anybody have a Bagster Bible? I had to look up and see what that was. Bible from back in the day. But he says, many of the chapters in Isaiah in this particular Bible had headings such as curses on the Jews, punishment on the Jews, and judgment on the Jews. But blessings of the church and joys of the church. Anytime God is saying something good for a people, well, that's for the church. Anytime it's something bad, well, that's got to be for the Jews. And you know what that's called? Replacement theology. Not true. The shame of my sin, yes, was removed at Calvary. But the promise is that the shame of the Jewish people will be forgotten. This is a promise to them. In fact, all of chapter 54 is for the people of Israel. God is singing to his people, talking to his people, comforting his people. Now you might say, okay, but it says here that for a brief moment, verse 7, I forsook you. For a brief moment. I, I hit, verse 8, I hid my face from you for a moment. Well, how can this be Israel that he's talking about? Because he, they weren't forsaken for just a moment. In fact, if you only consider the time of the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 up until Jerusalem becoming you know, the capital of Israel again in 1967, or even take Israel as a nation in 1948, was that a brief moment of time? 1,878 years. And I look at that and say, Lord, that's not a brief moment. But God looks at it and goes, yeah, it is. You haven't been in eternity yet. And when we're in eternity, 1,800 years is going to be like that. Hey, we've been a fellowship here, a church fellowship for eight and a half years. You know what? It's gone by like that. It's been a brief moment. But I can tell you, in the last eight and a half years, there have been moments in that time where I was in pain. Physically, in the hospital, emotionally, over things going on with family and friends. And if you had asked me in that second... You know, does, does this just feel like a momentary light affliction? No! It's terrible! Make it stop! It's been like two days! <laughs> and I'm reading this, and he says, this, this moment, I rejected you just, just for a brief moment. Well, 1,800 years to God is brief. What does that tell us about our grief today? It is brief. It is momentary. And Paul says as much. We read this verse last week, 2 Corinthians 4.17. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Dad saw that last night. I could see that in her eyes, and she talked about that a little bit. Yeah, my back hurts, and yeah, it's, it's kind of getting hard. It's hard to stand. There are times where I'm standing up, and the, and the pain's intense. But she said, you know what? But it's just so brief. I'm like, Yes. She knows what she's talking about. You can go through a lifetime of pain, and it is a brief moment compared to what God has waiting for us in eternity. And it kind of reminds me that, all right, so I can handle a little pain here. I can handle a lot of pain here. Because it is not forever. He is forever, and our home is forever, and that eternal home is what He promises us. Yeah, it was a moment that I forsook you, He says, but I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to show you great compassion, everlasting kindness. I will have compassion on you, says the Lord. So Zion's song will be fulfilled, and Israel's shame will be all forgotten. No, no one in the Millennial Kingdom is going to look at Israel and go, remember when they had to wear those yellow stars? No one's going to remember. All they'll do is say, what a glorious thing God has done for this people. Amazing. Number three, 
Number three, Zion's stones will be firmly set. I like this. Verse nine. For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. Okay, so he's confirming his promise. Remember with Noah, he put the rainbow in the sky to confirm the promise not to be gay pride month. It's not what the rainbow is for. In fact, that, in my opinion, is a disgrace. And it flies right up in the face of God. For the first covenant promise he made with man was to put a rainbow in the sky and say, I'm not going to destroy the earth this way ever again. I'm not going to do that. But he's drawing off of that and he's saying, you remember how, how that promise has been fulfilled low these many years? Well, guess what? This promise is like that promise. I will be faithful to it. He says, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. Verse 10, for the mountains may be removed. And the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Oh, afflicted one, storm tossed and not comforted. And by the way, you can see that quoted on the Statue of Liberty. Verse 11, oh, afflicted one, storm tossed and not comforted. Behold, I will set your stones in antimony. And your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Antimony is a a stone. I'll explain in a minute. In sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies. Your gates of crystal. Your entire wall of precious stones. He lists more than five different kinds of precious stones here of dazzling color. Describing Jerusalem. Jerusalem of the coming kingdom. Stone set in antimony, which is a metallic silvery white crystal. Foundations in sapphire, or the other phrase, lapis lazuli, which is just a beautiful blue stone. Battlements of rubies, gates of crystal, and then walls of precious stones. He doesn't even list the precious stones there, although if you go over to Revelation 21, verses 10 through 27, I believe you'll see those stones listed. Same description of the new Jerusalem. But he says, this this amazing, beautiful Jerusalem, I'm going to do this, I'm going to set these precious stones in the walls in the foundation firmly there and I read that and I think how many of you would build a fortress out of rubies I don't think I'd do that <laughs> no offense you know Lord I'm, you know better than I do but but really we're gonna we're gonna set the foundations in sapphire and it'd be pretty your gates are going to be crystal. That'll hold them off. You know, <laughs> I'm looking at these stones, going these these can be fragile. These can be shattered. These can be broken. This is not. I mean, not steel. Give me steel. You know, and concrete, and let's let's build this thing strong. Let's build this this fortress powerfully. And this, by the way, is not a metaphor. He is talking about New Jerusalem. He's talking about the literal New Jerusalem and how beautiful it will be, and the stones set in it. But if you think about, well, would you do that if, if you really wanted to build a protected city, would you do it this way? How solid could it be? Ah, so you wish to know the secret of the stones of New Jerusalem. Well, look at verse 13. All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. Okay, there's security here. There's protection He says in verse 14, in righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. Jerusalem right now knows terror. The wall that's built around Jerusalem that separates the West Bank from Israel proper is huge. We've discussed it in here many times. 20 feet tall, it's several feet thick, massive concrete structure with barbed wire on the top. And it's there because they've got to combat terrorism. Since it went up, terrorism's gone down 98%. So that's how you protect Jerusalem. Well, not then, because then they will not fear terror. Then they will not be oppressed. Then they will be established. And that's the beauty of all these beautiful stones. God can build New Jerusalem this way. Why? Because the secret source of Israel's future security is righteousness. It's righteousness. 
Don't think of this as some vague, ethereal concept. It is righteousness. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You want to be strong in this life? You seek righteousness. You want to be impenetrable? You be righteous. You want to stand invincible before mankind? Righteousness is the key. You can't keep a righteous man down. Isaiah 53 verse 11 tells us as much. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. And the righteousness of Jesus secures the city of Zion and will in the coming kingdom. The city will be safe, secure, and protected from any onslaught or attack because (laughs) Jesus, the righteous one, is there. So build the gates of crystal. Lay the foundations in sapphire because the true foundation, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous one, will bring all the protection that is ever needed. And so the city can be beautiful and righteous. Just as in the spirit of Jesus Christ, you are beautiful and righteous. Because he makes us righteous. Righteousness is strength. Isaiah 59 verse 17 tells us the Lord put on righteousness like a breastplate. And the helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. But don't miss that. Righteousness is the breastplate. Critical. Absolutely critical for for protecting the heart, right? And what does Paul tell us tell us in Ephesians 6.14? Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, let me make a leap from Israel forward to us here in the church and say this. Engaging in spiritual warfare via intercessory prayer, if you're really going to take on the enemy in spiritual warfare, listen, it requires righteousness. Do not do it if you are not righteous. Or you'll end up like the seven sons of Sceva. Remember that story in Acts? Which is one of my favorite stories. I can't wait till we get there and can just really look at it. But they're, they're casting out demons in the name of Jesus because they think it's cool. But they have no faith in Jesus. And they are not living righteous lives. And the demons that they cast out come out of them and basically run them out of town on a rail. Marvelous story. Do not attempt to engage the spiritual enemy unless you do so in righteousness. Part of the problem... <laughs> I don't mean to bash on the church because we are the church, but part of the weakness that is in the American church today is a lack of righteousness. You know, and I'm not discounting grace. And uh, you know me, I'm not saying we ought to be legalistic, but we ought to be righteous. We ought to pursue holiness. And God wants to work righteousness out in us. The more righteous we are, the stronger we are. And the more we understand His grace, the more loving we are. So we can be both strong and loving by His righteousness and His grace. His righteousness protects Zion, New Jerusalem. His righteousness can protect His church as well. Verse 15 going on says, If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fall because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer for to ruin. He says, in other words, the smithy and Satan both. The smithy who makes the weapons and the destroyer who uses the weapons, well, I happen to be the one who made both of them. What's he saying? I could crush them like a gnat if I want to do that. I got power over this. Even Satan, you know this, is under the authority and power of God. He can't do anything without God's permission. God is the one who has a handle on all this. But listen to the firm promise. Verse 17, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. And this verse is often used by Christians, and it should be. I have no problem with that. Shielded by the righteousness of Christ, who is my fortress and my strength, I am invincible. And no weapon formed against me can prosper. I stand with Jesus, and I am covered by the blood of the Lamb. No weapon formed against me will ever prosper. Pray that prayer. It's a great prayer. It's a great promise. But remember, we're still talking about Israel. And God is telling His people Israel... 
This is their heritage. What is their heritage? Now I want you to think on this. Let me read the verse one more time and think about what is he saying here? No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me. This is their heritage. What does he mean by this? Listen, this verse is a prophecy. In and of itself, it is a prophecy of the durability of Israel. It's a prophecy of their permanency, of their existence. Their existence is their heritage. The fact that the people of Israel are even still on planet Earth is an absolutely remarkable miracle of God. And He has done this. He is the one who says, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Many weapons have been formed against Israel. For 4,000 years, however, not a single weapon formed against them has been able to wipe them off the planet. They're still here. They're still passing along their heritage to their sons and to their daughters generation after generation because no weapon formed against them can prosper. And by the way, neither will Iran's nukes. Now, I watch these things with great interest, and I can't wait to see Iran's nuclear reactor go, you know. But, but the reality is, even if they build and get finished and they have a nuclear weapon, it cannot destroy Israel. Not if God is true to his word, and he is. I want to just email verse 17. Maybe I'll tweet it to Benjamin Netanyahu. I think I'll do that. I'll do that when I get home. Yeah, because I, 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 you know, I'm on his little tweet. Benny and I talk a lot these days. No, I was going to tweet that to him. Hey, don't worry about Iran. No weapon formed against you will prosper. He says, and their vindication is from me. That word vindication, note this, is sidkatam in the Hebrew. The root word, the root, the, the word that it comes from is sadak, which is righteousness. Again, righteousness. Their righteousness is from me. Their righteousness, their vindication, it comes from me. The sorrow of the servant in Isaiah 53 yields the song of the servants in Isaiah 54. And it's a beautiful parallel. We come right out of that sorrow into the glory of Israel that God promises. And he says, I will be your vindication the stones of the of Zion firmly set. Gang, Isaiah 28, verse 16, already told us, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. And so Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He who made... He who... Let me try this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus, the righteous one, is the stone that makes all the other stones beautiful. So the song will be fulfilled. The shame will be forgotten. The stones will be firmly set. This is the song of Zion. Isaiah 55 takes us in a different direction. Two more things on our outline here. Number four. The saved will be fully fed. And I like this a lot. The saved will be fully fed. Verse 1, Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not Satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Gang, this chapter begins with a shout out of salvation to all people. To all people. This is not Israel anymore. Other than Jewish people who come to faith in Jesus Christ. This is a shout out to the entire world as it begins. Ho, everyone. Ho, it's the word oi. Oi, everyone. How far-reaching is the grace of God? This this shout-out of salvation. Everyone, come. How far-reaching is it, really? I love this verse, 1 John 2, verse 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. 
Now, there's no such thing as universal salvation, but there is universal invitation. In other words, not everyone will be saved, but everyone can be saved. Everyone could be saved. Everyone has the same opportunity to be saved because the call of salvation is universal to the world. Jesus died for every... He didn't just die for those of the church. Jesus didn't just die for those who believe in him. He died for everyone that they might believe in him. Which means his blood is sufficient to cover the sin of every person who's ever lived, past, present, and future. And if you're sitting there thinking... I just don't know. My sins are pretty bad. I'm not sure if his blood can cover me. Okay, do you realize how universal this invitation is? It goes far beyond you. You get wiped out in the deluge of the tidal wave of the blood of Jesus as it covers anyone who would receive it. As it goes out. No one will be able to say, well, his blood didn't reach me. The invitation is universal. Oh, everyone who thirsts come to The waters. So while Isaiah 54 is specific to Israel, Isaiah 55 is specific to everyone. (laughs) Everyone. Universal invitation. It's repeated, by the way, at the last of all Scripture. Revelation 22, 17. Maybe Isaiah 55, verse 1 sounded familiar. Revelation 22, 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, come. And let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Wow. Look at what he lists here, by the way, in verses 1 and 2. What I would call the four staple foods of the saved. All right? Those of you looking for a dietary plan, here it is for you. Water, wine, milk, bread. These are the four. He says, come to the waters. He says, buy wine and milk. And he says, why do you spend money for what is not bread? Water. You know, speaks of the Spirit of God. Water in the Scriptures always refers us or speaks of or or illuminates that picture of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 3, uh, 7, 37, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Come to the water. Come and be filled with my spirit. I will fill you up as much as you want to be filled. And by the way, he will not fill you up one drop more than you want to be filled. He's only going to give you as much as you want. He's only going to fill you as much as you're open to being filled. I want to overflow. I want to get on other people. See, that's when it's fun. You know? I was, I was the guy back in high school after I got my license that if we had a rainy day in Southern California, rare though it was, I was the one driving my car looking to splash people on the sidewalks. You know, this was how my mind worked. I want to get all over people. I want His Holy Spirit so overflowing on me that as I walk around, people are going, oh, what is this? Getting all over. What's going on? Come to the water, He says. The water of life, which speaks of the Spirit. Why? Come by wine, he says. And in this context, understand that wine speaks of joy. Joy. Psalm 4, verse 7. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. And wine is that picture of celebration and of joy. Milk and bread. Milk and bread in the scriptures are both similes for the word of God. Both pictures of God's word. Peter says in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. And Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 says, He humbled you and he let you be hungry and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Is like bread. Jesus turns around in John 6, 48 and says, I am the bread of life. Jesus, who John called the word of God, says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Well, this is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Good eaten comes by the word of God. You want to be filled up. You want to be sustained. It comes by the word of God, both on the page and in person. The Word of God. But notice something here. This uh, grocery list here is expressed with concern over the world's eating habits. 
He mentions this whole list. Look at verse 2 again. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? We daily are feeding on all manner of processed foods that are killing us. And I'm not talking about McDonald's. We in this world, as believers in Christ, part of the everyone who have now become sons and daughters, who have now become saved, we are eating food that is bad for us. Processed junk that comes out of the carnal nature, that comes out of mankind. We watch it on our stupid TVs. We read it in stupid books. We listen to it in stupid music. It is constantly around us. And we're always just, you know, it's this fatty foods. It's destroying our hearts. It's undermining the righteousness of the church. All of this that's going on around us, garbage in, garbage out. You know the old phrase. And the more of the garbage of this world we take into ourselves as opposed to the pure milk and the, and the strength of the bread of the word of God, the more of that garbage we take in, the sicker we're going to be. The less we're going to be able to stand up to the enemy and his wiles. We will not be able to have spiritual warfare to fight those fights of intercessory prayer. We're not going to have the righteousness to do it. God says, I want you to get back to basics. Water, wine, milk, bread. Eat these basics. My spirit, who brings you joy. My word, which brings you sustenance as in milk and bread. What are your favorite processed foods? It might be a good place to start. What are the things I'm eating? What are my spiritual Pop-Tarts? And there are no Pop-Tarts in my house anymore. Cheryl's getting all healthy on me. That's good. What are your processed foods spiritually? What are the things that you just enjoy? I mean, be honest with yourself. I just like it. You know, I, I like that show. The acting's great. The storyline's great. Yeah, I know there was this thing that happened. But, but it's a good show. It's a good show. I like... Is it processed food? Or is it whole food? Is it good food? Processed foods of the world, gang, they're the things that we eat that are not from above. They are manufactured by man. And we sang the song tonight. Paul said in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And by the way, don't miss how this song of this universal invitation began. It begins with the word, ho, oi. We've seen this word before, but it's not translated, ho, It's translated, alas, because the word oi has a hint of sorrow to it. Oi, alas, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Alas, why are you spending money for what is not bread? Your wages for what does not satisfy. This is an expression that comes from a sorrowful place within the shout out of salvation. Sorrow over those who will ignore the invitation. How, and I realize it's a parable, but it's a parable that portrays God the Father. How does the king in the parable of Jesus feel when the invitation goes out for his son's wedding and no one comes? That would be sorrowful. It would be disappointing. And the invitation goes out yet again and nobody comes. And so he sends the invitation out to the highways and the byways of the world and invites anybody, anybody who will, just come on. There is sorrow any time you're saying, here's the invitation, and the invitation is rejected. The lesson I talked about it today, here's the tension of following Jesus. The joy of your own salvation, but the tension of the lack of salvation for people that you know. I, don't, I think a lot of times in the church, why there's not more evangelism is we just don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about my lost relatives, my lost friends. It's too, it's too painful. We need to be both in pain for them and in joy over where we're headed. This should be a joyful place, right? We are on route, route to heaven. We're going to be with Jesus. Any, any second now, any day now, any month now, He's coming. Great joy and great sorrow because the moment that happens, I know there are people who will not be with us. And we have to walk with both hand in hand. 
Now, cultural context matters here. He says at the end of verse 2, a great word, delight yourself in abundance. The word abundance is deshen. We've seen it before. Deshen is fatness. I read it to Cheryl. Look what it says. In the original Hebrew, delight yourself in fatness. Give me another cookie. <laughs> delight yourself in fatness, he says. But, but here's the cultural context. We hear fatness, and we immediately as Americans think, okay, well, that's just not healthy. No, because we're thinking like Americans, and to us, fatness is a totally different thing. Buxfazen says the Israelite was, in general, an abstemious person who lived mainly on vegetables, grain, and fruit, with an occasional addition of fish or meat for festive occasions. So the Israelite needed a certain amount of fat for health. And this fat came mostly from olives and olive oil, which we know is actually very good for your heart. Olive oil is. So to delight oneself with fatness was something highly desirable. Eat healthy. Man, if if you are eating of of the food list here, the water, you're drinking the water, the wine, the milk, and the bread in these spiritual terms that portray such wonderful things, then in addition to that, delight yourself in the fatness of what the Israelite would understand to be olive oil. Oil again, picture of the Holy Spirit. Now there's something really cool going on here. Eat up because all of these staple foods are gratis. That is, they're free of charge. These will not cost you a thing. Cheryl and I are right now reevaluating our eating habits and what's good for our kids and, and, how, and trying to make some very, actually very serious changes in our whole dietary plan. And as we're looking at that, I'm going, man, but whole foods are expensive. Satan's done a work in America. You know, processed foods are cheap. You can get them anywhere. It's the whole food. It's the natural stuff that you're paying through the nose for. And, and that's why a lot of people just go, oh, I can't do that. Not with God. It's free of charge. Come eat the best. It is all free for the eating. It is free for the drinking. It is all obtained by gratis. Grace. It's all obtained by grace. But watch this. It's obtained by grace, these foods. And did you notice the order that the prophet brings these foods? Water. Speaking of the spirit. Well, the spirit that we are born of. Wine. Speaking of joy. Milk. Speaking of nutrition when you're young. Bread. Speaking of nutrition and nourishment as you grow older. Olive oil implied in the fatness, speaking of a real work of the Spirit in your life. What are you talking about, Rick? I'm saying the saved will be fully fed. I think what we have here is a picture of the life cycle of the saved person that begins with being born of the Spirit, redemption, which leads immediately to refreshment, as in the wine of joy. And then we walk with the Lord in the nourishment. At first, at first with milk, right? The milk of the word at first to, to, to cut our teeth on it. And then we move on into the bread, which is our sustenance and our staple continually. And with that, the olive oil of the spirit who functions as the helper, the comforter, the balm for our spirits, who strengthens and nourishes us. These are the staple foods of the saved. And it's a beautiful picture that's laid out before. And by the way, if that's not enough, these staple foods further represent the coming kingdom. Joel said in Joel 3.17, Then you will know I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. And in that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. Marvelous. The life cycle of the saved, the saved will be fully fed. And number five, fifth and final one tonight, the saved will also be faithfully led. The saved will be faithfully led. Verse three, incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. The Hebrew there is chesed David. (laughs) Hanimanim. <laughs> the faithful mercies shown to David. It's literally mercies, David, faithful in the Hebrew order there. Now what's he talking about? The faithful 
mercies shown to David. He's talking, well, the most obvious thing is the Davidic covenant. I showed David my most faithful mercy. God said to David, 2 Samuel 17, 16, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. The Lord tells David this. The Davidic covenant. It is that covenant which requires the coming literal kingdom on earth for a thousand years. God said, on your throne, I will establish this. I'm going to make this happen. Your kingdom is going to endure. The kingdom has to find that fulfillment and will literally on planet earth. But there's also a very personal reminder of the grace God showed to David, the faithful mercies to David himself. Not just the bigger covenant, but the very personal grace he showed. Look at verse 4. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. How is David a witness to the peoples? Well, all any Jewish person, all any Christian has to do is we can look back at the life of David and say, wow, God is merciful. God is gracious. God who loved David, who raised him up, who gave him everything that he needed. And then David went and had an adulterous affair and committed murder and came up with this whole cover-up. Fast and Furious 1. No, they, no. He, he covered this whole thing up. He lies about it. He murders. He commits adultery. He does all these horrible things. And what does God do? He forgives him. That's faithful mercy. And so we can look at David and say, if God will do that for David, he'll forgive me. I know he will because of his faithful That's the witness of David. But notice he's also called a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, the past, he was a witness to God's faithfulness, but in the future, he still has more to do. And I love this. It's just one of those cool little nuggets in Scripture, cool little truths. You say, wait, 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 wait. David still has something to do? Well, David's dead. I've seen his burial place, supposed, there in Jerusalem. David's dead. And he was buried centuries before Isaiah's prophecy came about. What could David possibly have to do? And the answer is, reign in the coming kingdom. What? Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 9. They shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Jeremiah said that after Isaiah, long after David was dead. I'm going to raise up David. He's going to serve as king. Ezekiel says it. Ezekiel 34, 23. I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, some say that's a messianic statement that my servant David is talking about Jesus. Well, the problem is David's never talked about that way. Jesus is called the son of David. Well, what about Messiah ben David? It's not biblical. Remember what? Let me pull back a second. Sunday, we talked about how the Jewish people came up with two different messiahs. To try and justify and make sense of Scripture, they came up with Messiah ben David, the glorious Messiah, and Messiah ben Ephraim, or Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering Messiah. And rabbis today will say, yeah, well, that, that, that's actually a good way to look at it. Perhaps there are two messiahs, one who suffers and one who is king. The Bible never teaches that. There's only one messiah. Now, he is called the son of David, but Jesus is not called David. David himself. Rick, do you believe this? Yes, I do. David himself will be raised up to rule in Christ's kingdom. Jesus will rule over all. Well, that sounds ridiculous. How does that work? Same way you will rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom. As his servants came. And Jesus is clear about this. And the revelation is clear about this. You will rule and reign with him. We will be serving in Christ's kingdom. So will David. King David will once again, and I believe that the location that King David is going to be in charge of will be Israel. That's his location. He's going to feed my people himself, and he's going to be their shepherd. Verse 5. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you 
Because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Who is He talking to in verse 5? He's talking to Israel. Now in the midst of this universal invitation, this salvation call to everyone, He is talking directly to Israel. You, Israel, will call a nation you do not know. And a nation which knows you not will run to you, Israel, because the Lord your God, the Gadosh Israel... For he has glorified you. Okay? So it's Israel that he's talking to. That's the you here. Okay, well, if it's Israel he's talking to, then what nation is he talking about? And I suggest to you that the nation is the church. That this is the church. Listen again. A nation, you will call a nation that you do not know. And a nation which knows you not will run to you. Peter said in 1 Peter 2.9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of whom who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The new nation, made up of both Gentiles and Jews who come to Christ, the new nation is made up of believers in Christ the Messiah. And we don't replace Israel, but we will run to her. And we do support her. And we do love her because God does. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. When's that? Right now. Right now in this age. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man His thoughts and let him return to the Lord. That is, repent. Return to the Lord, and He will have compassion on him and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. And this is the universal invitation. And these are the days of the Lord's favor. We live right now at the tail end of the age of grace, when the most wicked among us, the most messed up and sinful and unrighteous, and some of us were... Among us are invited to come to the feast of salvation. To enjoy the water of the Spirit. And the the joy of the wine. And the milk and the bread of the Word. And to dip that bread in the olive oil. And to experience all of this in the feast of the Lord. But my friends, remember this. Though this is the age of grace, the days are about to turn. And the days will turn to a time when the call to repentance will give will be given up to the call to simply choose up sides. There's a different call at the tail end of Revelation 22, verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Why is that at the end of the revelation? Because at that point in the tribulation, repentance has stopped completely. And the Lord recognizes that repentance will not yield any more fruit. Therefore, if you're righteous, be righteous. And if you're wicked, be wicked. Choose up sides. Praise God, right now we still are in the age of grace. We still have a little time. I don't know how long. But let's make the most of the time, for as Paul said, the days are evil. Let's be about the business of seeing people saved. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts and our minds. May we take this in, Lord, spirit and soul. Receive these things and believe on them. Father, protect us, surround us, strengthen us by your righteousness, by your goodness and your holiness. And may we, Lord, offer the grace that you have so graciously given us, gratis, free of charge. Lord, may we learn what it really means to eat of the food that makes us healthy as believers who follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.